Welcome to AP Calculus. Today's lesson is 5-7, Graphical Definite Interviews. I'm your host, Mr. Fendel. Today's date is Wednesday, December 9th, 2020. Our objective today is to do what, Fiona? Calculate definite integrals graphically. There it is, yeah. So yesterday we were calculating those definite integrals just algebraically, and now we're looking at it. What does it look like as a graph? Mm -hmm. Um, let's look at this function, the definite integral, or I, I really shouldn't say that, I should say the integral between zero and three of two with respect to x. So what is that? Um, we can do this purely algebraically first, and then I'll show you how it translates graphically. So um, it's a little bit hard because it's tricky. I don't know how often you've seen this, but let's try it. Uh, Teflon, antiderivative of two. Would that just be two? Not quite. So think of this as this two is really two x to the power of zero. So the power is going to go up, right? Oh, so two x. Um, over one. Exactly. Yeah, two x. It goes up to the power of one. Divide down by the one. So it's just yeah, two. Um, and then we don't do plus c teflon. We do. Um, that straight line thing. Yeah, evaluation bar between zero and three. Zero and three, very nice. Um, and then Chris, the next step. Um... So every, we're, we're first gonna plug in the end instead of the start. We always do n minus start. So you're going to plug in three oh. because you see an x. Two times three. Keep going, yep. Uh, minus two times zero. Two times zero. And there's my other one here that just popped up randomly. Two times zero. And you can do that, Chris. What is this about with you? Uh, six minus zero. Which is? Six. Six. Okay. So, um, I mean, there was calculus involved. Taking the antiderivative of two is tricky, but in essence, it, it was a pretty easy thing to do. The answer was six. How does that look graphically? This is a function. If I were to say the function y is equal to two, that's our function, right? Or I could say f of x is equal to two if I want to use function notation. But how would I graph y equals two? Can you use your cameras to say, yeah, it looks like that. Is it a curve? Is it a line? Is it a line that way? What does y equals two look like? Use your camera so I can see if you know what you're talking about. Oh, shoot. Hold on. Give me a second. Chris. Most of you, Fiona and Andrea, have it. I don't know about Teflon. Um, I'm not great with graphs, so I don't know. Okay, it's, it's just a horizontal line that goes through too. So um, it looks like this. Yoink. And I know I, I sometimes am guilty of putting myself in a box and saying, I'm just bad at that. Um, but it is a slight fixed mindset. So just say, oh, I, that's just an area that I grow more. And it's a, a different way of saying it. It's a more positive way of saying it, right? That one. I just need to grow in that area a little bit more. So there's our equation, y equals two. So the definite part means that I'm specifically looking at the x boundary 0 to 3. So if I use a different colored line now and say, OK, the x boundary, that's not a line. That's a drawing tool, Mr. Sindel. This x 0 to this x coordinate 3, and it's saying, hey, everything um, that is above the x-axis, that's positive. So my boundary is every, the, the x-axis down here. Um, these lines and this top line, and I clearly have a rectangle right there. What is the area of that rectangle? Even if you asked like my son, he would count one, two, three, four, five, six squares. The area is clearly six. If you want to be a little bit more technical, you can say it is a three by two rectangle and three times two is, hey, that number right there, which is six. I would like to point this out as well. I kind of briefly mention this, but this is above the x-axis. Above means positive. If I had area that was below the x-axis, that area is negative. 
Um, and this is the thing that will eventually trick us when we start doing weird functions where I have a semicircle and then a weird triangle and a bunch of stuff like that where you have to add and subtract pies and non-pies. This one is positive because it's above the x-axis. So, yeah, I think I'm just going to move on to the next one. All right, so this one um, is very similar. The integral from 1 to 4 of negative 3 dt. Um, oh, it's t instead of x, so um, it doesn't really mean that much for us. How would we graph negative 3? Show us with your cameras again. Instead of doing something that was right here, you do something that's right where? Right. Yeah, exactly, down. So going ahead and graph negative three. It's just that horizontal line at negative three. And then our boundaries again are from one to four. So I will grab my line tool and from one to four and it's that rectangle. And again, just count the squares or it's a three by three a rectangle slash square in this case. And the area is nine, but it's not nine. Why is it not nine? What is the actual answer here? Nine is close. I'll give you like half points if you said nine. Is it negative? It's indeed negative, Chris. Yeah, so it has to be negative nine. Why is it negative, Chris? Uh, it's below. Exactly. So I'll come down here and say negative. Oops, bad handwriting. Negative because below the x-axis. Let me go underline those keywords. Um, and then to do this algebraically, there is a shortcut that I should show as well, but let's do it the long way. Um, let's go Fiona, antiderivative. Negative three X. Well, it's a T in this case, but yeah, negative three T. Oh. And then put the evaluation part between four. Yep, Andrea, can you do the rest of this to get negative nine somehow? It would be negative three times four minus nine, negative three times one. Yep, keep going. It would be negative 12 plus three. And there it is, yeah, negative nine. Nice, nice. Um, yeah, so there is um, the shortcut that I want to talk about is if you ever have just the integral of a number, which is what we had in the last two cases. So the integral of, I'm just going to say a number, there's no x here. Notice I'm not putting x, just the integral of a number. Um, there should be a dx, but I'm going to make this as short as possible is, uh, again, if it's definite from a to b, is equal to just do b minus a times that number. And let's see if that makes sense. So what do we have to do first in our formula? We'll subtract the bounds. So up here, I'd say four minus one. Okay, that's three, very clearly. And then I multiply it by whatever the inside number is. Three times negative three is a negative nine, negative nine, that works. And let's check it again up here. Subtract the bounds. Three minus zero is three. And multiply it by whatever the inner number is. And three times two is indeed six. So again, your shortcut, if you just have a number is subtract the bounds, b minus a, then multiply it by whatever that number is. That will work every single time. Okay. Integration of a linear function. Okay, so we were just doing constants to begin with. Now it's linear, it has an x value. Um, let's give this to Chris. Can you take the antiderivative for us? Um. Is it x squared? It is indeed x squared, yeah. It was, and you originally had two and then you divide down by two, so that's where that two went. Nice, x squared, not plus c though. Is it that, what is, what is that thing called? The evaluation line or whatever? Evaluation bar, yeah. Evaluation bar, uh, from zero to two. Zero to two, nice. Uh, Tap one for the rest of the math to get an answer, a numerical answer. 
will be four minus zero. Yep, and I can do the hard part, four minus zero is four. All right, nice, nice. So we know the answer is four, but we're not doing this algebra activity today. Today we're doing it graphically. So graph, everyone, the equation y, and we can do it right here, y is equal to 2x. What does that look like on that graph? And if you are just having that brain fart moment where like, I don't remember this, you can think of this as 2x plus zero. This is in slope intercept form. The intercept is zero. It goes through the origin. The origin is one of the points on the graph. It has a slope of two, right one up one, right one up one, and there is our line. I guess I should have made you do it on the camera. Okay, and then let's talk about our bounds. So our bounds now are from zero to two. So from zero, well, I mean, that's already touching the x-axis. So I don't really need to draw a line here. That might confuse me. I think I'm talking about the area up here, but it's always the area between the curve. This curve maybe is a bad name because this is just a straight line, but between your function and your x-axis. So, ah, that's not what I want to do. So really what I'm talking about is this triangle down here. And maybe I want to, to shade in this triangle and say, yes, this is the triangle that I'm talking about, just so I don't accidentally think that I'm talking about that area up there, which is infinite because it goes up and up forever. Okay, well, if I just had that triangle shape, uh, Andrea, what would I do to, to find its area? It would be like the base times height over two. So it'd be eight over two, which is four. I'm gonna write down everything you just said. Base times height divided by two, which means you are doing two times four over two, two cancel out, and you got four. Nice. Um, and eventually we're gonna be doing piecewise functions where I have many different little pieces. Um, I think that's in the homework tonight too. So each of these pieces, you want to actually label that piece and say, this piece right here has an area of four, maybe circle it or something to let yourself know it's not accidentally a dimension of the triangle. You might, if you put it four there and didn't circle it, maybe you thought you were talking about this distance here. So have some sort of method where you identify it. Yes, the area of that little piece is four. Nice. Let's move on to the backside then. All right. Again, let's do this algebraically first. Um, let's give it a Fiona antiderivative. One half t squared. It is one half t squared. With the evaluation drive between one and three. One and three, nice. And um, yeah, Teflon, and then we'll get Andrea to do an antiderivative. I realize I haven't given you one yet. Teflon, you want to do the, the evaluation here? Um, yeah. Would it be nine over two? Nine over two. Minus one half. Yep. Which is? Four. There it is. Nice. So you obviously know the answer is four. Let's see how that looks down here. Everyone graph T. Or the equation F of X is equal to T, or F of T is equal to T, or Y is equal to T. What does that look like? So hopefully you have a graph that looks like this. It's the most basic equation you can have. No, or the Y intercept goes through the origin. It's a zero, the slope is one. Um, and then what piece are we talking about? We are talking about the piece between one and three. So between one and three, and then kind of shade in your region so you know which one you're talking about. So I'm talking about this region right there. Okay, well that shape is, I mean, you could use the equation for a trapezoid if you, tilt your head sideways and look at it like this, maybe it's easier to see the trapezoid. Um, because remember, if you have a trapezoid, choink, 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 the, the area formula is hard and don't use it. Um, the way that you should do this is by separating it into two different pieces. So the way that I will do that is by 
grabbing the line here and just going, um, I can't make it long enough because it, this program is kind of silly. Ah, no, right there. Um, these are my two different pieces. On the bottom piece, I have this one by two rectangle. In this top piece, I have a two by two right triangle. And then you find the area of both of those. Um, Andrea, what are each of the areas? It's two and two. Two for that bottom one, two for the top one, and those add up to four. Done. Nice. And darn it, we didn't get any antiderivatives. Sorry, Andrea, I'll get you tomorrow. Um, let's move on to the piecewise piecewise graph. So um, we don't know what the function f is, but we do know that it looks like that. So if I'm taking the bound from 0 to 5, 0 obviously is right there, 5 is over here. That's the region that I'm trying to find above the x-axis. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and mark where end boundary is right there and probably shade in this general region just to make sure I know what I'm talking about. Although it's really hard to make a mistake here. So I'm talking about this region right there. Um, but I think that's gonna make things confusing. So I'm just going to divide this up into easy shapes. So how are you gonna do this? I'll let you guys try this first. Divide this up into shapes that are easy to find. Right now it's kind of this weird, not even a trapezoid shape. I would just call this a, a composite shape. All right, so I'm curious what everyone did. My first idea is just to get that right giant rectangle as isolated as possible, and then to make this harder shape into an easier shape, um, like so. So I really have three different shapes here. Um, and it doesn't really matter how you divide it up because it's always gonna be rectangles and triangles, right triangles, I should say. Um, Chris, what is the area of each of these pieces? Of the, sir, um, those two little ones are the are they one? Two little ones are one and one, big one, big rectangle over here. Uh, twelve. It is indeed twelve. Nice. So we add them all together and we say that is equal to thirteen. <laughs> nice. Ooh, this next one is kind of fun. So let's check our bounds first. Bounds for the next one are between negative two and three. So negative two means I'm starting right there. Okay, that works. So I'm finding all of that area, finding all of that area, and then I'm going all the way to three. So I'm finding all of that area as well. I'm I'm finding all of this area. So let me come back here and just say, um, yeah, find all of the areas of the triangles. So um, I'll I'll let you figure out how you want to approach this problem in a, for a few seconds. And then I'll ask. So Teflon, what was your approach? Um, little, little point five. I don't know if that's right. Ooh, you're really, really close. I think you made a mistake with being below the x-axis means a negative. Um, how, what was the area of this uh, first triangle that you found? Two. Two. And then that means this bottom triangle has um, what value? Negative two. Negative two, exactly. And then the top tiny Wait. triangle is that one half. So even without finding the area of these large triangles, so obviously the two and negative two cancel each other out and the answer is one half here. But let me talk about the, the little shortcut that you can make. Without even finding these areas, if I didn't know them, I can tell that these two triangles are congruent and I can immediately just say, oh, well, they're gonna cancel each other out. I don't even need to calculate them. And that will save you a lot of time. If you ever have like a, a semicircle and another semicircle, where you're like, oh shoot, how do I 
It's like you have pi r squared, and then I have to take half of that. Which what's the radius again? Don't even worry about any of it because they cancel each other out. One is below, one is beneath, and I'm sorry, one is above, one is beneath, and they're the same. They're, they're congruent shape. Just cancel them out. So you can say that's congruent, that's congruent, and you're just left with that one half. Um, but yeah, it does help to know that it is an area of uh, two up here and an area of negative two, just in case you have to do it the old fashioned way. Cool. Well, that concludes the notes. So zoom out. That's what they look like. Um, FIS5, really quickly, how well can you calculate these definite integrals graphically? Five, five, four, and four. All right, thank you.